Um, my name is Michael Wong. I am the I am like um, Chandler's counterpart at IBM. I lead the compiler the, the, the compiler group, the, the Excel compiler group in terms of strategy. I used to be their team lead. And through all that time, I've been the C++ standard rep. And as time come, go, went on, I started accumulating other jobs and other titles. I seem to accumulate lots of titles, which pretty much means I, don't, I barely get anything done. I, get, I have great people behind me who get lots of things done, and they make me look good, and that's really the essence of it. But I still need to get my hand into a lot of research. Um, I do a lot of work in terms of transactional memory, memory models, atomics. I can go really deep if you, you really want me to. But today, I want to talk about something that I've been, I've been you know, thinking a lot about in the last recent um, two, three years, because it's been my job. It's been my job to think about future programming models and where we're going, especially with regards to parallelism. Being the CEO of, EO of OpenMP also means I also have to think about how, and OpenMP is all about parallelism, um, also means that I have to think about how I want to chart it for them. So this talk is going to be a mix of what's going on today. I hope I can do it in half an hour, what's going on today. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of models, including stuff from C++, SG1, in terms of the parallelism and the concurrency TS and the transactional memory TS that I, that I wrote out. And I also want to look ahead and show you stuff that, it, that, that, that don't exist yet, but I can see, foresee it coming in terms of what's going to be the future models that, that, that I'm looking at. So with that, I want to go through just a few things here. Um, this sometimes happens. It doesn't synchronize, so hopefully this fixes it. Okay, I'm just going to restart then. If it doesn't do what I want to do. All right. All right. So the usual things comes up, of course. Um, it's moving there, but it's not moving here. Let me do that one more time. Sorry about that, guys. It's a programming job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now it's moving synchronously. See, this, the synchronization thing is always a problem. So as usual, <laughs> that wasn't an intended joke. But as usual, um, I get a lot of uh, input from my groups, um, the various groups I chair. Um, but nevertheless, I always want to mention that, that all the good stuff is always mine. No, 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 just kidding. It's always other people's. All the mistakes are still mine. Um, and then there's lawyers who always want to make sure that I cover all these things. But let's, let's skip over that. So yesterday, I, I, I looked at this again. So I was at a parallelism workshop. Um, and of course, I looked at this, and I thought, I kept staring at it. And I kept thinking, there's something wrong with this sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I am an immigrant, um, really. I am. I, I live in Canada. But you know, you know, you can fool me once, but you can't fool me twice. And somehow, come on, guys, I just, I just didn't think this was the actual place I was supposed to be. But nevertheless, um, it does convey the, the message reasonably well. Um, this is the parallel programming model of today and tomorrow. So what I want to talk about are these things. I'm going to talk about why, what, is, what is the rush? Why are we going toward massive parallelism? And it's because the recent things I've been working on is primarily about accelerators and, and GPUs. And I want to say, I want to show you what it looks like very quickly, I realize not everyone's interested in OpenMP, but I want to show you what accelerators look like from OpenMP, what it looks like right now, and what it, was, what it will look like in the future once I'm done with it for C++, because I'm chairing this new group called SG14, which has to do with games development, low latency, uh, constrained resources, and financial application. And to some extent, to some people, that also means embedded programming. And, I want to, and one of the things we're tasked with is to develop such a GPU accelerator model. Okay, and I can already see what it's going to look like right now based on what we have from SG1 in terms of the future, in terms of the parallelism TS, and the concurrency TS. So what's the rush? What is it with GPU accelerator programming that has everyone um, running around with their, with their hair on fire? Is it just a flash in a pan? Well, no. The reason is the, the United States Department of, um, I think it's like the Department of Energy or something like that, has legislated that we must reach exascale computing by... 2018. Okay. Now this is a graph of the top 500 supercomputers, and the most important one to look at is this, this red one right here. Okay. Now just to give you an idea what 10 to what exascale computing means, it means 10 to the 8, 10 with 18 zeros behind it, 
10 to the 18 floating point operations per second. Okay, just think about what that means. And think about where we are. Where we are right now, this is a little bit older, so we we'll just uh, finished another graph. Um, the best supercomputer is almost, almost, almost there. Okay? Um, the rest of this is like the aggregate of all 500 supercomputers. As you can see, that doesn't actually enhance it by that much. And this is it. This is the top 500 super, this is the fastest computer in the world. It's in China, it's called a Tianhe 2. I don't actually speak Chinese, I hope I pronounced that properly. It's, it's, it's an Intel system, millions and millions of cores using essentially an OpenMP and an MPI uh, model. But the key ingredient there is that it uses accelerators. It uses a Xeon 5, which is an integrated accelerator in it. Now, the, the, the next contender down was something at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's called a Titan computer. It uses, um, I think it's, I think actually it's, okay, I think it's Cray, but it uses NVIDIA cards. And most of it is commercialized, commercial off the shelf, things that you can essentially pull off the shelf. That's what they're trying to go for. The real problem with these guys isn't reaching that speed. It's the heat that's generated that's going to be, that's always the problem. Okay? And they think accelerators can solve some of that. This one right here is actually, um, it was a supercomputer, it was one of the fastest, it's actually from my com com company. Um, it's called a Sequoia. It's no longer in the running because it has no accelerators in it. Okay, so that's how why we that's why there's this big rush towards this programming model. And of course, when you look at the what's called, you know, these monikers about the Internet of Things, that everything is going to be connected with massive with, with things that are embedded in your um, in your car, in your cell phone, telecommunication, medical devices, Watson being able to answer generalized human queries about oh, I just have a cough, and it can tell you what the problem is because it can research and read thousands of medical journals as is. And of course, the idea of Amazon delivering packages um, in under an hour, I'm still trying to struggle with that model. I actually don't know what is that important that has to be delivered to my door in under half an hour, but I, I will pay three times the, the amount of money for it. There's only one thing I can think of. I think it's like life-saving medicine. But I really don't think I need a pizza that badly that I would pay three times to get it in under half an hour. But it is here now. And of course, finally, games. When you have, when you, when you have games that now demand buttery smooth Hollywood style graphics, okay, these guys require massive, ex and I remember one of the first reasons that drawn me into computers because I love playing games. I don't have time to play games anymore. But this, this is a, a game from the most recent um, World Warship. This is apparently the USS Albany. And you can see the details of the graphics that's going to be built. I'm, I'm not sure if this game's even released yet. It's, it's the picture was, was, uh, was released by one of my co-chairs for SG14, the games development group, and who's from Wargaming. Okay? So, that's why, we need, that's why we need massive parallelism. So of course, you've got to stand back, and every now and then, you've got to say, what now? The C++ 11 standard is 1,353 pages, and 14 is about 20 more pages. I can guarantee that 17 will probably add, oh, I don't know, probably another 200 pages. Half of them are mine, transactional memory. The other half is probably, the other three quarter of the remaining will probably be concepts light. When you say, wouldn't you agree, Peter? Okay. So you can see that an OpenMP 4.5 is also growing by leaps and bounds. So what I did when I became CEO of OpenMP was I changed immediately their mission statement from, um, from doing just shared memory parallel. They were limited, honestly, to just shared memory parallelism, such that it now covers any kind of parallelism. On any, on any kind of platform. I basically expanded the mandate because we were working hard on accelerators and it was, and it, it, it didn't have any shared memory. It was different, it was already discrete memory already. So we've already pretty much broken that. So what does the OpenMP4 model look like for Accelerator? It's a, it's a host-driven model dispatching code to multiple accelerators and coprocessors. These coprocessors could be digital signals processors, things that are running in your guitar, um, things that are running in, term, in terms of a drone. It doesn't have to be, a, you know, it doesn't have to, be, have to be one of the big, heavy NVIDIA 760 cards that you might be thinking about, but it, but it could be. And in fact, that's what people are using for, to, to try to get us to exascale computing. Now, the thing is that in today's world, we just don't know whether the memory is going to be separate between the hosts 
and the accelerator, or it's going to be unified as we think it will be in the future. We think that in future, that's where we're going, that it's going to be unified. Even today, NVIDIA has a way of look, making this look unified. In fact, they call it unified memory so that you can program it to look like it's the same thing. They realize that ultimately this solves a lot of problems because when you have discrete memories, pointers is a real big headache. You don't actually know a pointer on a host and a pointer on a device actually behaves differently. Okay. So some of the things that we've been looking at in our design have tried to take that into account. Now here's, the, here's a quick snapshot of the OpenMP4 um, um, device construct for target accelerator. It's actually really small. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but suffice to say that all you have are two constructs for dispatching to a, an accelerator device, about three or four constructs for, for memory model, for moving memory from the host to the device and the host and the, the device back to the host. And two special constructs, I call them for acceleration. What they really are are specially made constructs to deal with hierarchical memory that is typical in some vendors' accelerators. Anyone know who those are? The most famous one you can think of? Yeah, it's NVIDIA, okay? Most other accelerators don't, some other accelerators don't have that kind of hierarchical memory, okay? In my world, Saxby is a big deal. This is your basic sum of a, a, a times x plus y. It, it tests some of the, the, the most stringently the, um, the instructions that are in any, any particular hardware. So, it's actually pretty simple in mathematics. You just do it like this. And if you want to do it sequentially, this is essentially the sequential code. And if you want to do it in parallel and dispatch it to a device now, you start adding these pragmas to this instruction. And it starts looking like this, OK? When you add these target, and then you create these target um, teams, teams construct, it immediately spins up multiple blocks okay, of threads. And this, this emulates NVIDIA uh, warp and block very closely, but it only uses one thread to handle this particular doubly nested for loop. And then you add more, div you have more constructs and, and you're basically telling the, the, the system to say, I want to spin up these teams, which are blocks of threads, and within each block, I want to distribute it. And the reason you needed to do this is because in NVIDIA, there's a, special con there's, a, there's, there's a special thing where between multiple blocks, they don't synchronize. This, is, this actually makes things go faster. So you have to say distribute it across all these blocks, but they don't synchronize now. And then what happens is finally, once you enter the, the, the innermost most nested loop, then you can spin up, you can use up all the threads that you've been spinning up, and then now you can truly reach massive parallelism. That's it. That's how you do it. And I can tell you that it's now going, it's going to be in GCC, and we're now putting it into Clang, okay? Most likely, if I were to do a prediction of the future, I don't have my crystal ball, but we, we were here today when I presented this as a key, uh, one of the keynotes for supercomputing. And 3.7, I can pretty much say that by 3.8 or 3.9, it's going to be there. 4.0 is probably going to be, have the latest of OpenMP, but interestingly, I would say 4.0 might even have the latest of C++17, because 4.0 will probably come out about February of 2017, and Clang typically has a history of getting the standard in even before it's ratified. Okay, so keep an eye on 4.0 and see if my prediction come tr comes true. Okay, so that's it with OpenMP. Having been the CEO for the last five years of OpenMP, I've watched this 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 development for quite quite some time, and I've noticed that there's basically two worlds. Um, of, of, of computing. There's the commercial world where we basically use things like Silk or, or C++ AMP or, or thread building block or parallel pattern library. And now you can also use C++ 11 threads and things like that. And this world almost never crosses over to the high performance computing world. In the high performance computing world, it's almost all OpenMP. Now there's also OpenACC to some extent as well too, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter that much to, to, to separate it. To separate, it, though, to separate them. At a low level, you also have things like OpenCL, CUDA, um, um, things like that, that somewhat crosses both industries. But I can tell you this, that you know, I was in Kona, Hawaii in the last standard meeting, and I talked to Pablo Halpern, and he's one of the architects for Silk, and we look at each other and said, you know, I said, you know, 
he says, you know, will, the, will, will Silk ever go into the high performance computing world? And I'm telling him that that's probably never going to happen. Those guys are never, ever going to use Silk. But at the same time, I can also tell them that, you know, OpenMP probably had no chance of making it into the commercial world because the difference is that one has way too many tunings and controls and knobs and the other one doesn't have enough. And because of that, it looks like that the world will never, ever join. And forever, they're going to stay apart. Well, I have good news. Part of this talk is I'm going to show you that I think C++ has a chance of bringing it together, of this massive parallelism that we can achieve for both worlds, both the high performance computing world and the non-high performance computing world. Because its current specifications are good enough that with some extensions, we can reach that world. Okay? Stepping back for a moment, you can see that in the past, we've tried to do all kinds of things to do that. Um, we started off with shader languages like OpenGL and CUDA and DirectX, and we slowly reach a higher and higher levels of abstraction with OpenCL, AMP, C++, AMP, AMP, uh, OpenMP. These days, we have even um, other people trying to implement a lot of these things underneath using Sickle, using Vulkan that's coming up as the new OpenGL replacement. And with HPX, I don't know if you guys went to see some of the HPX talks earlier, okay? They have already implemented most of the, this, the parallelism STL, okay? So what's going on in the C++ world? Well, we've got all these TSs going, okay? And we're roughly around here somewhere, and we're looking at releasing a major standard by the 17, and most likely after that, the uh, 20 and 22, okay? The big one that's coming up is parallelism and the concurrency specification. These TSs, the parallelism TS, mostly has what's called parallel STL, a way of parallelizing the standard template library. This is just a fundamentally important thing to do. The concurrency TS has the future extensions for DEN, weight any, and weight all, as well as latches, barriers, and atomic smart pointers. Now, these other ones are potentials for these packages, the parallelism TS in future is most likely going to have some sort of data, database parallelism of vector SIMD, task-based parallelism that joins Silk and OpenMP, map reduce and pipelines. The concurrency TS will most likely add executors, resumable functions, which is being talked about next door, um, counters, queues, concurrent vectors, and order associated containers, and upgradable locks. What is not being shown here is what they're going to do with GPU, because that wasn't on this picture when, we were, when, when they were designing this picture. So what's the status? Just to give you a quick idea coming out of the October Kona meeting um, of all the projects. Well, file, t file system TS is published. Great. The library fundamental TS that has optional any, any and string view is published. And with the, they're working on, on um, library, uh, library Fundamental 2 that has source code information captures and various utilities. Concepts is going to be published, um, sorry I spelled that wrong, with constrained templates on the user side. Parallelism TS is published and TS2 is now being added with task blocks and SIMD. That was the last discussion going on. And of course transactional memory, my TS, is also published. We're working on concurrency TS1. That's now voted out for publication. It has the stuff that we're going to talk about in today. I'm going to talk a little bit about transactional memory, the parallelism TS1, and the concurrency TS1. And concurrency TS2 is going to explore more executors. It's in here, as well as t parallelism TS2 on the previous slide, that is going to be hiding the GPU accelerator capability, the future programming model that I'm going to be talking about in the second half of this talk. Okay. There are other things like networking, ranges. Networking is, a, there was a design review, it's completed. Ranges is in the same place. Numerics is starting. Array extension, which went busted for a while because they couldn't agree about, what, about heap and stack switching for, for arrays. Now there's a new direction. Reflection is still in an early design stage. What else do we have? Graphics, um, waiting for proposals. Modules, some of you guys are deeply interested in modules. There's a huge fight going on right now between Microsoft-style um, modules, which doesn't handle macros, and Google-style ma um, modules, which does handle mo macros. But it's much more complicated to handle um, transporting of macros. So as a result, I highly doubt it's going to make 17, because whatever happens for 17 pretty much has to happen this, 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 um, 
in June in 2016 in Oulu, in Oulu Finland. Coroutines, um, it looks like one form of coroutines, the Microsoft style, using a weight is going to move forward. I think that's what they're going to talk about. But there are competing proposals still coming forward, a library-based stackful coroutine proposal coming. Okay? And contracts with preconditions and postconditions, they're still in an early design stage. All right, so the parallel and the, concur the concurrency planets look like this. Um, we have essentially the, 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 the mother planet of WG21, which has the core working group, the evolution working group, the library working group, and the library evolution working group. And orbiting these planets are, are moons of parallelism and concurrency. There's SG1, which handles most parallelism and concurrency ideas. SG5, transactional memory. And SG14, which handles low latency. And low latency mostly do have to do with concurrency and parallelism, but has the specific mission that it has to be performance capable. Okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these things. So starting with SG5, um, the transactional memory construct. By the way, all of these TSs demonstrate an incredible ability for multi-company collaboration. And you can see by all the people, um, all the names down there, that it demonstrates essentially that it's not just necessarily within ISO. You know, we used to say that if a couple of companies all talk together, it's called collusion, and you can take them to court. <laughs> if you do it under ISO, it's legal, and you could do it. So, so I know it's, it's weird, but that's how that's the legal definition. <laughs> so. You know, with, with, with transactional memory, the key thing there is always about composability. Locks don't compose, and with transactions, they do compose. Because if, they, because if locks don't compose, you have a big problem with today's software model, which is basically banking everything on libraries. Everything is a library that calls libraries. They're, they're, they, they automatically assume they compose. If one lock is inside some library and you put a lock outside of that library and calls into that library, pretty much nothing works. You, cannot, you, can, you can assume at some stage there is going to be a deadlock. That's what, breaks, that's what breaks composability. So as a result, what we've designed is actually a fairly simple specification that has very few constructs. Um, it only has two. There's, the, there's a group of atomic constructs which gives you true transactional rollback capabilities. And they're divided into the no accept case. That's the case if no exception comes out. The commit case where it says if a commission, sorry, a an exception comes out of your block, then you're going to commit that, that transaction. And then the cancellation case where it says it, when a, an exception comes out, you're going to cancel the whole block. Okay, you're going to roll it back. The reason we separated it like this is because we couldn't get people to agree what is the, the, the appropriate default behavior should be when an exception comes out. If an atomic exception comes out, is that an error or is that a, 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 a code flow path? Some people think of it as a code flow path, right? I know, I know, I, I, I cover my eyes and I know a lot of people do. In fact, when I mention this beyond us, and he says, what, people still program like that? <laughs> the other way, the second construct is this one, synchronized. Synchronized is unique in that it gives you a simple way of replacing locks. It doesn't roll back, it always commits, and it's a simple way that can, can be used as a lock replacement that's composable. That's all it is. That's why we have to separate the two. The reason you have to separate the two also is because there's some, you know, designing transactional memory as it is, and I've gone through multiple of these designs now, um, the real problem is actually legacy code. How do you handle print statements? Print statements fundamentally break atomicity. It tells you, it tells the rest of the world, it's a broadcast, it tells the rest of the world about what's happening in your, in your inner guts. That totally breaks the whole model with transactional memory. I'm not gonna talk about these other ones, just suffice to say that they help to make things uh, transactional safe or functions and things like that. But I'll show you a simple model. This is essentially what it looks like. And you could put code like that that says, you know, if it's a cancellation, um, um, this thing's going to appear to execute atomically. And if you throw, okay, um, under some specific condition, then this thing's going to be canceled, as I said before. Synchronize is cool because it can handle print statements. This is a transaction unsafe statement. You cannot put any transaction unsafe statements in inside of an atomic block. They're just good for calculations that can be done, or memory accesses that can be done, 
um, without any kind of exposure. Okay? So if you ever want to print something or you want to call anything that's transaction unsafe, what are things that are transaction unsafe? Pretty much anything that's volatile, if you give a signal or anything like that, just transaction unsafe. And so what happens is if you want to do some I.O. without transactions, you can't. Because when you do that, when, when you call threads, what happens is that you're going to end up creating you know, things that are coming out of order. Okay? But if you, call a trans if you call a transaction, it might work. So let's say I call it as an atomic no accept. Then in this case, I actually get three hellos. Why is that? Oh, one of them rolled back <laughs> and restarted again. That's not what I want. So what you really want is a synchronized block where it doesn't roll back. Okay? It's a simple lock replacement, and therefore you can get the answer you want. That's why there are two, that's why there are two blocks. That's why there are two constructs. Now let's look at the parallelism and concurrency TS. Sorry, I'm going through these fairly fast, and you can probably you have probably seen some of these on um, CPPCon videos, so I don't really feel the particular need to um, go too deeply into details. So what's the difference between parallelism and concurrency? I really like this particular definition. Never mind the words, let's look at the picture. The picture says that if I am in some sort of competition where I have fair amount of independence, meaning as I run, I don't actually have to interact with other people okay, beside my lane. Okay, I might look back to see if he's get, catching up to me, but that's about, oh, that's about it. Then that's a par that's, this is a parallelism case. Okay? In the concurrency case, it's like a basketball game where I have to pass balls to each other, someone might intercept me, in which case I have interactions with other people. And that's the case that they have called concurrency. Some worlds don't make this distinction. Okay? But so because of that, we've actually had this brand new TS called uh, parallelism. And I can almost guarantee this is going to go into C17, okay? pretty much as is. And it has a lot of rich project history. It's also another multi-vendor um, 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 collaboration case. There's a lot of pre-existing experience um, on this using Thrust and Boost and Bolt as well as C++ AMP, and I've mentioned parallel pattern library and the thread building block. And implementations now of the actual TS exist through the Microsoft Parallel STL, the HPX Stellar group. Uh, I don't know if you guys were at the tutorial. They implement it using their system, and they've actually extended it. Coldplay also has the SICO um, Parallel STL. They've implemented it underneath. SICO is a form of higher level OpenCL. Okay? HSA Foundations for HSA for Math, um, Lutz, and NVIDIA has also all implemented. So there's a lot of implementation. That's why it's just going to go in. I'm almost certain of that. Okay? In fact, I'm, I think we voted in the, last, in the last meeting. The motivation was to parallel, parallelize existing algorithm library. Now, in, in reality, you can't actually parallelize every STL algorithm. Some can and some can't. Okay? But in a nutshell, it looks like this. It says that by specifying a an execution policy as to whether it's sequential or parallel for parallel execution or parvec for parallel and vectorized execution, you're going to be able to get the algorithm in that particular mode. And because this is actually a parameter, you could decide it at runtime, if you like, by creating something that looks like that. Um, now, what is interesting is, I'm not going to explain these too much because I want to make sure we get through. Um, this is a slide that shows all, this, all the algorithms that, that have um, um, parallelizations, like find, find if. Um, they've added two new ones for, four, for each and for each n. These ones are, cannot be parallelized. Okay. What is interesting is for the future. With this capability now, we can start focusing on the future parallelism TS2 which is going to be looking at control, control structures. That's going to fo focus on what's called bulk work creation. In that word bulk is where the blasting to massive parallel cores is going to be available. Okay? Execution policies that can expose non-sequential execution and executors controls of how when work is created and specific agents that are the units of work. Okay? So I want to, I'm going to talk a little more about that. But before I do, I want to go over the other TS. Yeah, go ahead. I probably do. No, I intended that. 2020, <laughs> 2020 yes, thank you. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, well, my God, the decade goes by so fast. 
We were so young back then. <laughs> I know. So what's the concurrency TS about? Well, um, it's another case of multi-company collaboration. Okay, it's got a couple of major things. It's got improvements to the existing stood future um, on, atom on, on atomic smart pointers and latches and barriers. I'm not gonna talk about the last two, but I wanna talk about the first one just quickly. Okay, these are the guys that's been involved in it. It's mostly a Microsoft driven because, it, because concurrency was, is, has been deeply important to Microsoft. In Windows, you just never ever want to see that hour, hourglass that says, <laughs> yeah, that says I'm waiting. So as a result, these guys have, have already a, a very rich um, future continuation mechanism and they want to extend it to beyond what, what they have. Now, just to quickly go back, what asynchronous calls are their building blocks um, for there's uh, the building fundamental building blocks are stood async and future and unlike the, uh, the raw use of stood thread you might ask why wouldn't I use stood thread instead the real thing is that these allow values or exceptions to be returned okay just like normal function calls okay and this is a great slide from Hartman where essentially it tells you what a future is a future is just an object representing a result which has not been calculated yet the key thing to notice there is that this enables transparent synchronization of producers and consumers and that this turns concurrency into parallelism, okay? And when that happens, then you can say um, there's lots of ways to get hold of a future. The simplest way is just use a stood async. Will you make a computation, will you make a promise of some answer and promise to put it into a future? And you could do many things for seven and a half million years and then you can finally get the result and realize the answer to the whole universe and everything is 42, as it always has been and always will be. <laughs> there are three ways to, do a future, to create a future in the standard, async, package tasks, and promise. And the tutorial yesterday did a great job of showing what some of these things are. Okay? Async is essentially concurrency like with sequential processing, so that one location calls a concurrent task and dealing with the outcome is as simple as with a local sub-function. Stood thread, as I said, is a low, low level approach. And I think uh, Hartmut had a great keynote last year where he says, using stood thread is like using go to, to Okay, so don't even think about that anymore. Because now you have much better tools at your disposal. There's stood promise and stood future, which, simple, which essentially simplifies processing the outcome. They allow one location to call a concurrent task, but dealing the outcome is essentially a lot more simplified. With package tasks, it's the helper to separate, it, to separate task definition from the call. One location essentially defines a task and gives you a handler for the outcome. And then another, another location gives you, um, um, decides when to call the task and the arguments. And then the call has to be necessarily, doesn't have, doesn't have to necessarily happen in another thread itself. Okay? This gives you a great idea of what it might look like. But what I'm interesting is, interested is in, the, in, the T, in the concurrency TS. It's got a lot of great features, which I'm just going to show you um, just in a few um, ideas here. First of all, it gives you composition of long running work. Okay? Um, this is because fundamentally, if you're trying to count two files, C++ basically suffers from a total deficit of asynchronous operations compared to other languages. And this, is, this proposal introduced key, key asynchronous um, operations to stood future and stood share future and stood async, which essentially enhance these, these rich libraries. And two of the ways it does that is by having continuations which, um, um, which can allow you to launch a task and get the result, as well as ways of giving you mo binding multiple continuations together, chaining dot dens, okay? And also give you a way for more advanced compositions, like sequential compositions, like f dot den a and then dot den b, as well as parallel compositions, which only works on shared futures, and a way to do, to do what they call join and choice, where essentially, um, when all, essentially is in, for instance, in some search, if all the results come back, or when any results comes back, okay? And here's a way of, so here's an example of concatenating two files, okay? And you start reading from one file and then start reading from another file and then you would join the results into a when all task so that when that task completes, you know you've got the data from both files, okay? And this is a demonstration of when any, 
where essentially you're creating a future that completes when at least one of the argument completes. The choice operation is implemented by when any. This operation basically is going to give you a future object that completes after one of the multiple input futures complete. And then the future that's returned holds a vector or tuple object here with the, future, with the input future as elements in the same order. So this is a pretty amazing thing that you can have now. There are a few other things like make ready future, which says, you know, some function may already know the value of the, uh, at the point of construction. So in these case, the value is immediately available. So you need to be returned as a future. And make ready future is a way to be created so that it holds a pre-computed result in the shared state. Okay. There's other thing that questions, is it ready? Okay. And unwrapping futures, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I want to talk about where we're going in the future because all that stuff exists now today. Okay. We've got the OpenMP accelerator model. We've got the parallel, mod, parallel TS model. We've got the concurrency model. None of the, the, in C++, unfortunately, none of that supports massive parallelism in the form of accelerators yet. They still need to, things like how to handle data. And that's coming in a SIMD proposal. We try to get one in, in Kona, but, but the two sides between, in, be, between the two sides couldn't quite agree. Task blocks is now um, um, accepted into um, uh, TS2. Um, so it's coming, but we didn't, get, we didn't quite get executors because executor is the missing component that you're going to need to dispatch to a massive parallel system. The embarrassingly parallel case we've already got through async and threads. And then finally, data flow, we still need dependencies to come in. And the executors that can come out could be modified with dependencies. Okay. Or you could use it with dot then because that's how, I think that's how HPX does it. Uh, no. 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 Is it? Because I saw a, a den with a dependency there. Uh, well, yeah, we have different, so you can model it. Right. You, can, you can model your data flow with dot then. That's, that's definitely possible, right? Yes. But uh, it comes with an associated cost. Mm. Um, so you have a, a small overhead. So the, the, the real thing that you mo might want to do is, so um, Goran Nashinov, um, the, the inventor of the um, coroutines, Okay. The, the current favorable coroutines proposal with this await, right? right? That's that's something very convenient to actually model the data flow, so you don't have to you don't have to do the, the explicit um, continuation style programming, which is sometimes very hard. Okay. And based on that, we actually implemented a library based solution called Dataflow, which is um, something like when any dot then, right? Uh, okay. When all dot then, sorry. Okay. So, Thank you for talking, because that gives me a chance to catch my breath and take a trick. <laughs> but no, I, I'm going to cover this a little bit later about this. But first of all, then, so here's the thing. This is what ignites all of this stuff together, because I want to talk quickly about where SG14 comes from. In CppCon 2014, a bunch of gamers came to me and said, you know, and CppCon is a great place for gamers to meet, because it's, the, it's in Seattle, it's near um, Vancouver, where, Ubi, where EA, Electronic Arts, and Ubisoft are. A lot of gamers um, attend CppCon. However, the games people can never attend standard meetings to change the standard, because they're, I mean, if you think you have a hard job, these guys literally sleep under their desk when it's time to release a game. And believe it or not, right now, around right now is their busiest time, November, December, because everyone's trying to release games in December. In the last talk, by the way, I just recently, I just attended the last talk on embedded programming. Um, I don't know if the gentleman's here. Um, they talked about the embedded people having some of the same problem. And we known, we, we've always known that. And these guys have their own STL, EA Electronic Art has their own STL. And I didn't even know that the embedded people have their own STL as well too, but it makes sense. It's telling you that there's a huge community that have needs and it's not being fulfilled, okay? And if you look at this graph, it's telling you who are the top users of C++. Now, I know statistics can lie, but this is telling you that, you know, these, I think it's done by JetBrains, who's just outside. Um, they tell, they tell me that the finance, the top users of C++ are the finance, the banking group, and the games people, followed by some of these other groups. So as a result, coming out of CppCon 2014, we created this Google group, which initially focused on um, games development and low latency, okay, and embedded systems. There's actually already an unofficial subgroup called, but they, they never became official, so I think it might be reasonable to fold them in. 
And we, st we presented a, a, a paper in Lenexa which demonstrated the need of this group. And so we officially became SG14. As you can see, there are, um, there are a whole bunch of other ones, but this is one of the first ones that has, that has that's caught people's imagination because the name is readily recognizable. It's industry name. You might look at some of the other ones like concepts and reflection, unless you're actually in the community, you might not actually have any idea what they actually do. Although with this group, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys do. By the way, this HMI is, is two-dimensional graphics. Okay, and then this is undefined behaviors. So there are subgroups trying to deal with the various aspects and needs of the embedded community, as well as the games development community. What the intention of this group is, 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 is that because they can't come to the standard meeting, I suspect many of you guys who are in the embedded community cannot come individually either. What the intention of this group to do is that we're gonna have proxy members, members like me, like, uh, um, like other committee members that are here that are gonna go hear their proposals at their, at their place. And the place that games developers tends to, tends to congregate are like, believe it or not, CppCon, games developer con, okay? And by holding the standard meeting right there at that location, we, we process the papers that they want to present to us. In the last meeting, which was a CPP con, we've already processed about eight papers, proposals to the standard. At this point, because we're trying to make 17, the, the, the proposals are kind of small. So they deal with like flat containers, circular queues. Um, there's a proposal to, to support intrusive containers. Most of these have the theme that they are compile time base with no, no accidental growth that can somehow uh, cause you jitter if you're looking at graphics. I just listened to the guy on Embedded and they have similar problems. They don't want the car to crash if you suddenly get a BOD, which is called the, the blue screen of death. I think that's what people was looking at. So, but the major, but this group also looks at major themes. The t major themes this group has been looking at are things like, um, what about exception handling or RTTI? Both industries almost always just turn them off. Now I can tell you that eliminating exception or, and what, so what's the deal with the problem there? The reason that's a problem is because it's basically infused in the STL. You, if, because it has exceptions, it uses exceptions and emits exceptions, it means that both industries pretty much throw that hugely richly usable um, capability away and design their own. They can't use it. You can't even use open source software that use any kind of exception. That was a big bane that, that um, the wargaming people were talking about. So the question was, can we completely throw away exception handling? That's just never gonna fly. I can tell you that that's just, you know, that's like foreboding. Um, Beyond is never gonna, ever gonna go for it. What we can talk about is lightening the cost of exception. I'll tell you two ideas that people have been talking about. One is lighten the load of existing exceptions so that if there's a throw, it immediately terminates and catches are like no ops. Just think about if that will fit your need because half the time if an exception actually comes out, you probably just want your program to stop and crash, right? The other way people are talking about right now, it's just a brainstorm, is a dual, accept, dual error path for C++ libraries such that there's an error, there's a simple low cost error, let's for, you know, simplicity say, call it error uh, numbers, you know, error code path, and then exception path. Now, believe it or not, there are actually two TSs that already implements that. File system TS has dual paths, and the, uh, uh, the ASIO uh, networking TS also has two paths, because in those cases, they absolutely make, have to make sure that, uh, that, that they can uh, have a low cost way of emitting an error. In a file system, an error that comes out might not be because there's an error. Maybe it's just the file doesn't exist. In, the, in a simple case like that, you don't want an exception to start bubbling out. Okay? So that's why if there's precedence. I'm not sure which one, and there's actually about eight or nine ideas that we've been working on. And if you guys have some thoughts there, please let me know. So join this group. But the point of this is that the reason there's this cross um, pollination between with, uh, with other industries is because they, 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 they they need to solve the same problems. They all have problems with re regards to real-time graphics or, or interactive simulations. They might have problems with low latency, and they might have, and they def almost everybody have a constrained resource in this group, okay? And lately, people have been suggesting that because we're pulling in financials, we might also look at big data analytic workloads as well too, I'm not too sure about that, but I am interested in almost all these cases. 
So that's who we are. And these are the proposals. Um, we are looking at things like array view, node-based allocations, string conversions, vectors and matrices, exceptions, ring or circular buffers, flat map, intrusive containers, allocator interface, erratic sort, okay? I hope some of these are of interest to people who are in both the embedded and the games communities here. Um, spatial geometry algorithms, contiguous containers, stack containers, fixed point arithmetic. But the big things that we're looking at are things like GPU accelerators, okay, executors. And right now, there are three ways of doing executors. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna look at those in a moment. But first of all, let's take a look at which, where, where things are right now. People that are coming to the standard right now are not just commercials and, and industry. National labs, high performance computing scientists are now attending the standard en masse. Every national labs from Argonne National Labs, Sandia National Labs, Lawrence Livermore, um, Los Alamos are all attending. And most of these guys are represented by high, in fact CERN is now there as well too. I, I, I wanna make sure I mention that. So these guys are all interested in high performance computing. And over time, C++ has slowly reached in deeply into the high performance computing domain, okay? The thing that has been unsatisfactory is that C++ still doesn't quite um, um, fulfill their needs in terms of cache locality control, that's what OpenMP gives you, as well as reducing contention, that's also what OpenMP gives you. But things are changing rapidly, okay? This, this is why my claim that C++ standard offers the best chance of a model that can work for both, okay? And there's some hope that there's gonna be a grand unification in about five years, if we can get to that point. Let me, see, let me back up that claim by looking at what C++ standard already has that can support this. Well, it's already got asynchronous tasks, that's C++ 11 future, plus C++ 17's form of dot then, when all, when any, I just cover that, is ready, okay? It's already got parallel algorithms. What is missing is we need executors, we need multi-dimensional arrays so that you can somehow corner a particular layout and transfer that to the GPU for computing. So the, the most likely candidate up to now has been C++ AMP, a Microsoft, mostly a Microsoft alone effort. Um, there's only one thing in there that we don't like. It has this restrict keyword. It, what it does is it's, it says that under the restrict keyword, certain, con, certain C++ constructs cannot be used with one of GPU accelerators. That might have been the case when it was designed, but across the industry, we almost uniformly all think that that's no longer the case because GPUs, because they're becoming general purpose, are almost all able now to essentially do all the things C++ demands, including polymorphisms, templates, exceptions. Well, that's, that's still to be debated. So when I look at those, so when I look at my group and they demand a GPU accelerator model, I've been looking at various candidates. And across the group, we've been looking at a, there's something called agency. I don't know if anybody heard of agency. I hope, I don't think so. So I'm gonna show you what agency looks like. Have you heard of it? Yes. Parallel pattern library. But this is the NVIDIA agency, yeah. But it might be simple, some, similar because the ideas um, cross-pollinate. There's the heterogeneous compute compiler from AMD. They tried to do it, and it's now in Clang. I'm also looking at Sickle from Codeplay. Are there people from Codeplay here? No? I know they're here. Um, and, I want to, and, I, and, and I'm looking extensively in HPX. That's why Thomas and I want to talk about this stuff. Um, because I think they've done the best job of, of implementing the parallelism and the concurrency TS. And they have already experimented with a lot of extensions, including accelerator extensions. Okay, this is what we want. We want a rich set of implementation experience. And I've already implemented the OpenMP accelerator side, so I kind of know all the problems that are coming with this, uh, with this model. All right, so let's take a look at what agency looks like, all right? This is agency, okay? You can get it from that link when you get the slides. So agency comes from three, comes actually in a, in a disguised form as an executor proposal. And right now there are actually three executor proposals. One is network-based from Christopher Koloff, and it's based on Booz Azio, 
Okay, so he designed this when he was he's working at Nasdaq, and these guys are absolutely interested in low latency. If you think you worry about low latency, those guys worry about low latency because it's a billion dollars for every seconds of every milliseconds of low latency that it's going to cost them. And the design is very simple because it's all about network dispatch, post, and defer. Okay, the other one is the task-based um, executor that comes from Google. It started out as a uses virtual functions for polymorphism, but it's slowly switching out. Um, and it's essentially it gives you the ability to, to dispatch small tasks. And then the last one is what I'm going to study and what I want to show you is the agency base that extends the parallelism TS by NVIDIA. Okay. I think we're probably going to only have enough time to look at one model, but that's, that's fine. So up till now, you, we, I, I show you TS1, and it has this execution policy for PAR, PAR parallel, parallel vectorized, and sequential. Well, that policy just describes what, what work is created. It doesn't describe where and how it's created. And this is where this extension comes from. Okay? Application developers generally care about where it comes from, whereas library developers care about how it's done. And parallelism TS uh, version one have some non-standard ways of doing that with a closed set of policies. And we want the work creation itself to be standardized. So there are many forms of work creation. They could come from different agents. They could come from threads, tasks, blocks, warps, okay? And there are many ways, and they could come from for loops as well as fibers, vector loops, or GPUs. Okay. If you can en encompass this in a new way of defining this, that's how we're going to do it. So this proposal essentially says, you know, that it, it has a uniform API, and, which, and it composes with the execution policies that exist right now. So, by the way, this is the glimpse into the future where we're going. One of four possible ways we're going, because I'm also looking at, like I said, HBX, Sickle, and HCC. But the key thing is it has this bulk creation this bulk agent creation mechanism that allows you to blast out massive parallelism. Okay. I'm going to show you what that means. Okay. This is what the TS2 could look like. Okay. It's going to have a parameter on the PAW, remember the PAW and the PAW VEC, such that now you can permit parallel execution on a, for, instance, for example, with user-defined behavior. And here, what you can say is that you're going, to, you're going to have make it parallel on my execution behavior, okay? Parameterized in such a way, then you can pr permit parallel execution in the current thread only, something that you would want to do. Or you might, you, want, you might want to allow vector execution in the current thread only, okay? Today, you could right for each n, which is one of, if you recall, that's one of the new parallelism TS, polit, TS algorithms. Um, you could write something like this, where essentially you say, so this is a, a basic sequential execution policy, with a, basically the way you would do a for each n walking through each of these iterators, for n amount of them. If you want to do parallel, this is what it might look like. You would have, you might, you might implement it using OpenMP, which would be something like this. Now, yeah, as much as I, I am the CEO of OpenMP, I'll be the, and this is how you would do it as a vectorize. OpenMP already has vector SIMD support. So you just say for SIMD, a parallel palm pragma OMP parallel for SIMD, and you would be able to execute, you could be able to, uh, to perform this parallel and vectorize capability. What's wrong with this? Looks pretty clean, other than the fact that it has a giant ugly pragma in the middle of it. Please. Yeah, what else? Good point. It doesn't really work with generic algorithms, right? How about this? The problem is I find that there's a poor separation of concerns here, okay? The algorithm semantic is conflated with the work creation. And there's redundant code going on in, in, in there. There's also a combinatorial problem in terms of the execution policies, if there are a lot of them, or algorithm implementation complexity over time. Here's what, um, here's what the, um, the, the agency proposal will, will, will most likely make it look like, okay? Here, the design that they're suggesting essentially associates an executor with each execution policy. And then, so the implementation here um, essentially uses the executor, executor that's associated with the policy provided 
by the caller to create all of its execution agents because for each n manipulates all the executors that it's going to meet uniformly via some sort of execution traits, then the implementation is valid for any particular execution policy. So this essentially avoids the burden of implementing a different version of the algorithm for each type of execution policy and allows for a user-defined execution policy. Amazing. And the result is that this is going to give us substantial reduction in the total code complexity for the library. Okay. So the, the API has this execution traits as well as these other things. So I'm going to take a quick look at what this execution trait means. Okay. Um, I don't actually have any comments about it other than that it returns a future. Okay. And now you can begin to see what some of this looks like. Because I want to demonstrate this using this capability, um, eventually using a Saxby routine, which I wrote up with, uh, with Jared's help. But here, um, there, there are two ways that um, you can dispatch um, asynchronously, using async execute. And either one might implement the other, as it turns out. So the cost of the task launch might be relatively expensive if it's SIMDs or the GPUs or clusters. But the two ways is there's a singleton way and a bulk way. Okay? The singleton way essentially creates a single invocation, uses uh, lambda expressions in, in, in case with an execution trait. Okay? And it uses this async execute. Whereas the bulk way just changes to, ah, do I get it wrong? No, it's async execute. But now you pass in um, the, actual, um, um, the actual lambda of what you're trying to do with the number of agents you want to do it in. Okay? There's also, a there's also a way to do it in a, synchro in a synchronous manner. But we don't, we're not going to cover anything about that. So going back to the Saxby routine, then right now what I can do is I'm, I change the words because in the, in the wiki they started using bulk invoke, but we can change that back to async execute. But this is essentially executing and sending it to multiple in a, for parallel execution on end devices okay, of this particular um, lambda, that is the Saxby routine itself, okay? And this is okay if you're executing on an Intel device with Xeon Phi because the, the GPU is integrated, but it isn't going to work on a hierarchical uh, GPU device where there's multiple, at least a two-dimensional layer of memory where one of them don't synchronize with each other, okay? So what happens then is here's a way to do it right now in Clang using C++11. Now, the way that, the only thing that's different here is that I've essentially implemented a two-level um, um, methodology where I'm concurrent on the outside, but I'm sequential on the inner loop um, for this execution. And then I create a concurrent group such that I can do this execution across all agents, okay? This is pretty cool because this is essentially leading me to what I think I can essentially build up a, an accelerator um, design for the future for C++. Right? Can we do this in HPX? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, you're working on it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you use Sickle? Okay. Okay. So I'm looking in the right places, hopefully. <laughs> um, 527, I've got three minutes left. I don't know if I want to go through the heterogeneous compute idea. But I want to, so I really pretty much want to stop here. Questions? Let's stop here and ask questions, because I know some of you guys are, um, are looking for dinner. I don't want to stand in front of you and food. <laughs> All right? Any questions about this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what about uh, non-uniform memory architectures? So you yes. talked about high-performance computing. Yes. Don't you have to do anything with the containers also to like pre-put the somewhere for the executors? Right. So this has to do with direct placement of threads, such that it has it's either close to the master or scatter and scatter across the across the the, the memory, such that it has an affinity. Yesterday in the tutorial on, on, on Parallel Workshop, I demonstrated how OpenMP does that. They have a place, this place mechanism. What we believe is that this is actually ideal because now we can actually do this with this execution policy specifying the placement 
so that it's particularly um, ideal for the affinity. I want to hear what you have to say about how HPCX does it. So what's, what's really cool is, so in, with OpenMP, you usually have to kind of um, emulate this first touch policy. Right. It's called first touch. Yeah. First touch to, yeah. um, to, 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 to place the memory on the different NUMA domains, right? And with executors, you can actually create allocators and pass some, some vector of, of executors in there. So one executor representing the first NUMA domain and so on and so on, right? and then use the same executors to actually process your data. And that's how you get data locality with the help of executors. You just right. confine your, your parallel algorithms within um, the set of cores you want to use for the specific. This is what's exciting domain. because it's as if we, we actually designed this with this in mind, but it actually all works synergistically. I also don't believe it when I look at all this it's, stuff. It's uh, totally awesome. It's, it is absolutely uh, awesome. Okay, one question here in front. Yeah. In terms of the hardware, are the yeah. hardware vendors already working with you, sort of moving the hardware towards what you're after, or are they already there, or do you think there's going to be a couple of generations of architecture? Okay, so the question Before is, you're ready. Are, are, we, are the hardware vendors already working with us in terms of seeing where we're going with this programming model? Um, it's never a, co a, a coordinated attack in my mind, but we, we, we for instance, IBM, where well, my company is, is working on this giant project called Coral, which essentially is trying to get to that 10 to the 18 flops. And the hardware vendors there is, of course, uh, IBM PowerPC and NVIDIA Tesla devices and Kepler devices. So we're working closely with them to design this future model. In the, in, by the way, that's incidentally why they're beginning to have you know, um, unified memory models and NVLink and things like that for faster interconnect. And this model works particularly well with that, with, with, with that system, okay? But I don't know about other, so Intel is also involved because they are also involved with the Coral project because they won the other half of the Coral project with Argonne National Lab. Argonne is going to implement um, exa exaflop computing using pure Intel devices, whereas Lawrence Livermore and Oak Ridge is going to do it purely with uh, IBM and, and NVIDIA combinations. The government do that to make sure that there's two offsetting teams so that if one does, does it badly, they've got the other one going. This is, the, this is deliberate. Okay, they have, the U.S. Has, is rich enough to be able to do, do it like that. <laughs> okay, there's also a European effort, which I think I want Peter to talk a little bit about, but I, you know, because I don't really know enough about it yet. No? Okay. All right, another question. This is really exciting, isn't it? This is the future, what we're going to be. You guys, are, I can tell you that I generally work things that are like a year to two years in advance of people. And I can tell you that in the next five years, every one of you guys will be doing some form of GPU or accelerator computing on some sort of massively parallel device. Because that's the only way in the future to, that, to get that kind of performance speed up. Okay? Any other questions? Or do people want to go for dinner? All right, sounds like it's dinner. Well, thank you very much, everybody.